This is Lake Taupo, New Zealand, the largest lake in Australasia. It is also the world's most frequently active and productive rhyolite supervolcano. Colin Wilson, geologist at Tiherenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, has spent his life researching Topo Volcano. He explains about the lake. Lake Topo infills a hole left behind by a vast eruption around 25 and a half thousand years ago. People have been able to demonstrate that there's a massive collapse structure something of the order of three to four kilometres deep and then backfilled by sediment and materials washed off the surrounding landscape. The rocks tell us that there have been large and small past eruptions of Topor volcano, but two that occurred in the last 50,000 years were massive on a global scale. The most recent of the two is known as the Topor eruption that has been dated at 232 AD. To understand the volcano, we look at what material it's thrown out that are now represented as layers over the landscape. The Topa eruption involved about 35 cubic kilometres of magma over a period of a few days at most. Before we go further, I would just like to give a shout out to our video sponsors at Tiherenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. For anyone looking into studying earth sciences, I can vouch for it as a great place to learn about volcanoes, earthquakes, fossils, rocks, glaciers, energy resources and earth history. Check out the link in the description to learn more, including about their new masters in natural hazards science and policy. And now back to the story. Colin takes me to our first stop a road cutting 20 kilometres from the vent of the volcano. What we see here that's of interest is a number of layers resulting from different processes. Layers that were formed from a high eruption plume going up many tens of kilometres with at the end the product of what's called a pyroclastic flow that travels laterally at speed across the landscape. So the fall deposits here have two very different varieties. Some layers tell us of dry fallout, curtains of pumice and ash dropping from the plume. This lower layer shows pumice that was winnowed as it hailed down over the landscape. Larger pieces fell closer to the vent, whilst the finer ash drifted further away across the Pacific Ocean. So you can see that the dark fragments which are pieces of the surrounding country rocks surrounding the vent that were torn out and ripped up into the plume they're much smaller because they're denser. These bigger pumice pieces in this upper layer tell of the much greater power of the later phase of the eruption. So to find pumices up to about five centimeters is an average typical example. Here Locally you will find pumices up to 25-30 centimetres long that implies an enormously powerful high eruption plume. These two middle layers in between formed when searing hot magma exploded through lake water, shattering into a fine but heavy water-soaked mud. So this material is finer grained in part because the magma has been shattered up so badly and in part because water has washed the ash out of the plume and brought it down closer to vent. In places we can see where water from this wet ash eroded gullies in the layer below and then filled them up with more mud from above. You may be wondering why you get such a different set of deposits from one vent. The answer to that is there was more than one vent. The vents for this eruption were spaced out along about a 10 kilometre stretch parallel to the eastern side of Lake Topo. So far as we can tell, there are no time breaks in this. There are shifts in the vent position, but this is all one complex sequence from one eruption. We think that this eruption only lasted a few days at most.
But the real destruction came with the finale of this eruption. A truly unimaginable blast sent 30 cubic kilometers of rock outwards across the landscape in all directions at speeds of 2 to 300 meters per second. This pyroclastic flow of scorching gas and rock shaved off hillsides, filled valleys, flattened forests and wiped out every living thing in its path up to 90 kilometers from the vent. We can see these pieces of bedrock that were ripped from the sides of the vent at the start of this massive explosion beside Mapra Road in Topol. Landscapes were buried and reshaped in an instant. Here you can see charred logs that were torn up, hurtled along with the flow and scorched into charcoal, now visible 1800 years later by the state highway on the desert road. This map shows the area impacted by this blast in the central North Island. It shaved the landscape. And we see that clearly here, where it has carved across the top of the existing layers to produce its own layer on top. Really one of the remarkable deposits of its type globally in the last five to 10,000 years. So was this the worst that Topor Volcano could do? Far from it. This eruption was relatively small compared to the one that happened around 25,500 years ago. Here, in a cutting alongside the Topol Bypass, we see several older eruptions, until further down we see this pinkish fine layer. This is the Uruanui deposit. In terms of sheer size, this is almost 20 times bigger than the Topa eruption. It's the world's youngest super eruption. The ash reached Antarctica, probably circumnavigated the globe several times. The flow deposits are up to 200 plus meters thick, about 10 times the size of the flow deposit from the 232 eruption. And just simply remade the landscape around the lake. Here at this scoria quarry near the lake is another location that gives a better idea of how much material was erupted. This is still only about 10% of what was deposited in this area north of the lake, but it starts to give you a picture of the scale of this eruption. The white bits are pumice, bits of new magma, freshly erupted, and then the dark fragments represent bits of the surrounding rocks torn up and thrown out during the event. The total volume of the eruption is about 1,100 cubic kilometers of pumice and ash, which boils down to about 530 cubic kilometers of magma, of molten rock. The main eruption during which most of the material came out in all likelihood is only a matter of a few days. The Oroanui eruption unleashed the largest volcanic event on Earth in the last 70,000 years. Here on Chatham Island, this 20 centimetre thick layer is over 800 kilometres from the volcano. The largest eruptions, certainly the two largest here, are so big that the magma chamber underground, when it's emptied, is left unsupported and it collapses to produce what's called a caldera. So there's a smaller caldera from the 232 eruption, but that's overprinting the huge caldera structure that was generated 25 and a half thousand years ago. It looks as though the magma accumulates at about five kilometers depth but below it, for another 10 kilometers, it's partially molten rock. I've learned today that Topo Volcano can produce these massive eruptions, but doesn't always do so. Sometimes, it seems, they're quite small. Mm. So, Colin, what's the prospect of a future eruption? And will we be able to tell if it's going to be a big one or a, a small one or something in between? All the indications we have are that there is molten rock accumulating beneath 
the lake now. So the volcano is very much alive. It's much more likely that the next eruption will be relatively small, relatively innocuous, but would still cause a lot of economic damage and social upheaval uh, in the central North Island. I would have said the probability of an eruption within the next decade or two is a few percent. It's more odds than buying a lotto ticket. OK, so we'd all rather the lotto ticket, mm. um, but you're more likely to have a volcanic eruption out of Topol. What, what makes you think that? We've had these earthquake swarms, these unrest events, the two latest in 2019 and 2022-23. They represent the movement of molten rock to relatively shallow levels beneath the lake. Now, this could just be accumulation of magma, or it could be the magma moving into position prior to another eruption. Once it's on its way, we know we have relatively little warning. It rises such that it comes from the magma chamber to the surface in only a few hours at most. So we're trying to work on can we discern from the products of past eruptions any signs of what those triggers were and the timing of them so we can say if this sequence of events is happening then we think it much more likely that an eruption is on its way. Gosh, that's a really interesting uh, thing I never knew. So that's been a fantastic insight into how a geologist can look at seemingly small outcrops of rock and find out a story with an absolute incredible um, epic scale of volcanic history. So Colin, thank you so much for this amazing experience exploring the past of Lake Topor.